Your voice is so weird. Did you hear the hinders? Uh, I hope not.
good morning. Good morning. And again, welcome to Countryside Church Unitarian Universalist. I am Lindsay Bates. My pronouns are thank you, she and her, and I'm glad to be back with you this morning. It is a widespread, nearly universal practice among Unitarian Universalists to mark our entry into sacred time with the lighting of our chalice. Flaming chalice is the symbol of our wider Unitarian Universalist community, and there are hundreds of chalices much like this one all over the world. When we light our chalice, hundreds of other chalices are being lighted too. And we light the chalice to remind ourselves of all that is possible, love and kindness toward other people, God has blessed you, courage and strength to do what is right, gratitude and wonder for the many gifts of life, comfort and hope when days are hard. We know we cannot make a perfect world, but we can make this one better. In this spirit of hope and commitment we gather, in this spirit may we live. And I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join together in singing hymn number 96 in the gray hymnal, I Cannot Think of Them as Dead. Congregation's Covenant. We unite to strengthen our bonds of kinship among all persons, to promote human dignity, and to increase reverence for life's creating, sustaining, and transforming power through worship, study, and service. And Tim has our for all ages. I would encourage you to look at the pictures um, and the slides because this, the illustrations in this book are amazing and each page kind of transforms from one side to the other. And that way you're not looking at me, you're looking at the screen. <laughs> Imagine a World by Rob Gonsalves. Imagine a world, imagine a world where the beauty has fallen can find a way to fly. Imagine a world where songs in the night awaken sleeping streets with a melody each home welcomes with unlocked doors and open hearts. Imagine a world where the challenge of riding on rough 
and rocky seas is also a chance to climb the highest peak. Imagine a world where even the deep, dark places are treasure rooms full of marvels, silent echoes of towers in the sun. Imagine a world where each word, each thought, each turn of a page in a book is the beginning of a bigger idea. Imagine a world where city lights float from their frames like a flurry of falling stars to brighten your way. Imagine a world where scissors snipping through the golden air conjure mountains that move. Imagine a world where patience, practice, and balanced steps make you a master of walking on air. Imagine a world where the help of a guide and the strength of your mind, you can visit the vastness beyond. Imagine a world where the pull of the wind is a hidden partner in a dance that guides the performers to greatness. Imagine a world where you're invited to step out of your solitude and join in the joy that you can make. Imagine a world where you can dive into a salty sky, soar over submerged lands into the secret garden of the sea. Imagine a world where you can climb up to a valley, paddle along a branch, and feel the cool shade of a forest from a single tree. Imagine a world where the words you share with others can bring them warmth and light. Imagine a world where rushing water steps and spins to life in the rhythm of nature's dance. Imagine a world where a breeze at the dawn of each new day brings the scent of an adventure that awakens the woods and lets stones set sail. Imagine a world where you can wander weightless on the earth and dream beyond the sky. Imagine this world. I invite you to join now in a time of meditation, reflection, and prayer. Let us call to mind all that fills the heart with gratitude and praise, and let us indeed give thanks for the beauty of the earth, our home, of which we and all life are a part, for the challenges we faced, for the triumphs and the failures that teach us how much our efforts and our dreams do matter. For all those who love or have loved us, and for all those whom we have been privileged to love, even if life's journeys have separated us from them. For a moment at least, let our hearts turn to all those things for which we are grateful. And for all of these, and for all gifts unnamed, perhaps even unremembered. May we ever give thanks and praise. Amen.
first of my readings this morning is by Rebecca Parker, former president of Star King Theological School in California. If it sounds familiar to you, it may be because you have indeed heard it from me before. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to sort, search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, its chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility, waiting. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. <clears throat> the second reading is a poem by Archibald McLeish. The young dead soldiers do not speak. Nevertheless, they are heard in the still houses who has not heard them? They have a silence that speaks for them at night and when the clock counts. They say, we were young, we have died. Remember us. We have done what we could, but until it is finished, it is not done. We have given our lives, but until it is finished, no one can know what our lives gave. Our deaths are not ours, they are yours. They will mean what you make them. Whether our lives and our deaths were for peace and a new hope, or for nothing, we cannot say. It is you who must say this. We leave you our deaths. Give them meaning. We were young. We have died. Remember us. They were young, most of them, and they died hoping that their deaths would have meaning. Whether or not that is the case is up to the living to say. It is always 
up to the living to say. Many, many years ago when I was in seminary, I did a summer ministry program at the Shaker Heights UU Church in Cleveland. The assistant minister there was Dr. Al Ziegler. One day he came into the room I was using as my office. He sat down and he told me he just had a visitor, a lovely young woman who had stopped in to thank him for the invaluable help he had given her, to let him know she had turned her life around because of him, and she would be forever grateful to him for saving her life. Ziegler accepted her gratitude gracefully. And after she left, he came to my office to tell me about the visit and to tell me he had no idea who she was. <laughs> no clue what he might have done. It had clearly been life changing, but he had no idea what the young woman was talking about. She remembered, obviously. He had no memory of it at all. Tomorrow is Memorial Day which now has become not so much a day of remembrance as the official beginning of summer. For most families, the academic year is nearly over and the kids will soon be out of school so they can help on the family farm, whether you have one of those or not. <laughs> not so many families have farms these days, so instead of going into the South 40 to plow, children and families are beginning their summer vacations. The routines of September through May are suspended. The hiking and biking paths are full, and many of our churches slow down to almost empty for the summer months. Memorial Day weekend is for cookouts and picnics and maybe a parade. Memorial Day began in the years that followed the Civil War as a way of remembering and honoring the sacrifices of those who died in that conflict. Various local groups held independent observations, including one of the very first, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina, organized by formerly enslaved people to give proper burials to Union troops. The first nationwide observation came in 1868 when Major General John Logan declared May 30 to be De Decoration Day, a day when flowers would be in bloom and could be gathered and placed on the graves of the Civil War dead, both Union and Confederate. Logan's order to his troops said in part, we should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no neglect, no ravages of time testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. After World War I, Decoration Day was expanded to include all of America's war dead. In 1971, Memorial Day was declared a national holiday by Congress and moved from May 30th to the last Monday in May. By extension over the years, it became a day of remembering first all those who have died in war, and then by extension, all those who have given their lives to the greater service of life. Remembering especially how the beloved dead gave of themselves to life's beauty and raged against life's evil injustice, and pain. So a question for pondering, whose lives have mattered significantly for you? Dead or living still, can you think quickly of names of those who taught you, inspired you, guided you, loved you into becoming the person you are? To whose lives does your life give meaning? from decorating the graves of the Civil War dead. Memorial Day now includes decorating family grave sites, cleaning up the graves of our ancestors and celebrating with picnics and parties that at their best are indeed celebrations of the connections that Memorial Day implicitly honors. Sacred memories of departed family and friends 
with gratitude for those lives and a living pledge to honor their gifts to life. How many of your families have Memorial Day traditions? Any? Interesting. When you were younger, did you perhaps visit the family cemetery plot to plant flowers? Some did. Trim the grass, pull out the weeds, maybe scrub some of the lichen off the gravestone. That was my family's big activity. In the two old town cemeteries in Cohasset, Massachusetts, there are many Bates family graves to be visited and cleaned up. Decorated with bright red geraniums, the stones cleaned of dust, grass clippings, and bird droppings. For Bates family members going all the way back to the establishment of the town in 1647. We don't know all of their stories, but we knew that old Captain Jack Bates still hangs out in the attic of what is now the Cohasset Historical Society, persists in moving his sea chest from the spot the museum folks chose for it to the wall nearest the harbor. We knew that according to our grandfather, the first Bates in that settlement was a horse thief who had barely escaped the London gallows. I don't have an image of a horse thief, but I did find this one. <laughs> because my siblings and I know all about how our grandfather and great uncles, as young troublemakers in town, once led a heifer up the stairs into the bell tower of the Congregational Church. <laughs> as you may know, it is not difficult to get a cow to go up a flight of stairs. It is darned near impossible to lead her back down. The Bates boys were well known to the citizens of Cohasset. <laughs> Yet another of my ancestors, my great-grandmother on my mother's side, was a devout and saintly member of Philadelphia's First Friends Meeting, who would spend all week carefully writing out and memorizing exactly what the Spirit would spontaneously move her to say during the Sunday meeting. With the horse thief, the cow movers, and the Quaker preacher, I figure I came by my professional choice honestly. <laughs> Their lives do continue in mine. And Memorial Day was always a day to tell the family stories, to reflect upon how our ancestors lived on in us. Many churches have traditional Memorial Day activities. At Geneva, which I consider my home church, the children would plant their own memorial garden for grandparents, pets, and other beloved departed members of their families. The church picnic was often on that Sunday with special activities that included a visit to Augustus Conant's grave in the town cemetery appreciating the flag and flowers placed there by the American Legion in tribute to Conan's service and death during the Civil War, and of course, telling Conan's story. And we can tell Conan's story pretty completely. I gave you the shortened version of it when I was with you back in April. Conan's family held on to letters, journals. His friend, the Reverend Robert Collier, wrote a biography of Conan just a few years after the end of Civil War. People whose lives Conan touched wrote down what they remembered, and their writings and his were saved and shared. So we at Geneva know his story and tell his story, as I told it to you a few weeks ago, honoring his life and remembering the cause of freedom and racial justice that he died for. On the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend in particular, we have remembered him. Are there any genealogists, amateur genealogists in the congregation, at least one or two? Okay. There's no quiz, you don't have to be afraid to acknowledge it. <laughs> but I wonder how well you can tell the stories of your ancestors. How fortunate have you been in the digging for the, the good details? Not everyone can trace their ancestry. There are many who have no idea who their ancestors might even have been, but everyone has descendants. How well will your descendants, and I don't mean just your children, 
because even those of us who have never been and will never be biological parents will have descendants. How well will your descendants know you? Could your family and friends tell your story now? And if they did, what do you think they would be likely to remember? Foibles? I can guarantee it. Skills? Probably. Values? I hope so. Embarrassments? Undoubtedly one or two. Your gifts? Your faults? Your virtues? Your service to others? I'm sure you're familiar with the ever-popular write-your-own-obituary exercise, asking yourself what will be remembered about you that makes you different, special, unique. In what particular ways has your life blessed the world? And your life has and does and will bless the world. Sometimes we let ourselves forget that fact. And in fact, often we have no idea that we are doing it. It is not we who get to say what the ultimate meaning of our own lives will have been. Dr. Ziegler wasn't the only person in the world to forget the significance of his words and actions in the life of another person. But it's not arrogance to consider the blessings we give to life. That's part of the gratitude for everything that Rebecca Parker summed up as the beauty and the rage, remembering that we too are called to be blessings. So how would you and how do you bless the world? What have you done or what do you want to do for the sake of the world's beauty? For laughter and joy, for love, for kindness, for gratitude, for righteous anger, for service, for justice, compassion, peace, the well-being of the world. And if responses don't come quickly to you, don't worry too much about that. Resolve to live your life intentionally for the deepest values you hold, for the ways in which you want to bless the world. And remember that all lives have an inherent meaning, existing as they do in what theologians call the mind of God. The meaning we know, however, is the meaning that we ourselves give to our own lives and to the lives of others, and the meaning that others give to us, which may not be a thing we easily recognize or remember. That meaning is found in the connections each life makes with others around it, the gifts of service and sharing and joy the examples of integrity and compassion and courage, the foibles and weaknesses that can also teach by example, ultimately the embodiment of a philosophy of living, of a faith that may not reduce easily to creeds or affirmations, but that is clearly visible in the day-to-day -day interactions of the soul with all the rest of the world. The meaning of a life does not lie in what one has accumulated, in how successfully one has conducted one's business, nor in how many people may remember your name. The meaning is in the human connections and in what those who are touched by each life choose to make of them and to remember. The connections are not always immediate. Of course, no one currently at Geneva, for example, ever met Augustus Conant, although I've heard from a couple people who claim to have done so. <laughs> but those lives and those deaths do touch us all. 
So think again for a moment of the person you thought of when I asked earlier, whose memory is important to you because of the way they touched and shaped your life? And consider, to whom will your memory be important? For what passions? For what gifts? For what service? For what joy? Will you one day be remembered? For surely that is how you wish to be recalled. The choice to bless the world, remember, is more than an act of will. It is an act of recognition. Recognition of the world's incredible beauty and of all that still remains and will remain to be done to make it a world also of justice compassion, and peace. Those who bless the world are filled with both joy for life's gifts and a righteous anger at all that hinders the sharing of those gifts. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. So may we choose to live. Amen. Each week we take up an offering over and above pledge members or member pledges. Your contribution supports the mission of Countryside, our presence in the community, the staff we hire to support that mission, and the building that houses that work. Your gift helps to maintain our church as the strong beacon of UU values in the northwest suburbs. Instructions to give electronically are printed in your order of worship and displayed on the video screen. This morning's offering will now be received. Thank you. And as we celebrate 
the memories and honor each other this weekend and recommit to being a blessing in each other's lives. Please join me in singing hymn number 1060 as we sing of hope and joy. Stand if you are willing or able or as the Spirit moves you. Thank you. Let us go forward together and live so as to bless and save the world. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin. Blessed be and amen. Amen. Um. 